الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أشهد أن أمير المؤمنين وإمام المتقين عليا ولي الله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أشهد أن أمير المؤمنين وإمام المتقين عليا حجة الله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد حيا على الصلاة حيا على الصلاة حيا على الفلاح حيا على الفلاح حيا على خير العمل حيا على خير العمل الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم اللهم أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله ما صلى الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله ما صلى الله أشهد أن عليًا حجة الله ما صلى على محمد وعلى محمد حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح حي على خير العمل حي على خير العمل قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر 
سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده الله أكبر الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده الله أكبر بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم ارزقنا توفيق الطاعة وبعد المعصية اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الله أكبر سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده الله أكبر الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وتقبل شفاعته وارفع درجته بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد الله أكبر سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده الله أكبر الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده يا لطيف ارحم عبدك الضعيف الله أكبر بسم الله وبالله الحمد لله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله
اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم إني أسألك موجبات رحمتك وعزائم مغفرتك والنجاة من النار ومن كل بلية والفوز بالجنة والرضوان في دار السلام وجوار نبيك محمد عليه وآله السلام اللهم ما بنا من نعمة فمنك لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله ما صلى على محمد أشهد أن محمد رسول الله ما صلى على محمد أشهد أن عليا حجة الله ما صلى على محمد حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح حي على خير العمل حي على خير العمل قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استغفر الله ربي وتوب يا محسن قد أتاك المسيء أنت المحسن وأنا المسيء فتجاوز عن قبيح ما عندنا بجميل ما عندك يا كريم الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله احد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا احد الله اكبر سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده الله أكبر الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده الله أكبر بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الله أكبر اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم ارزقنا توفيق الطاعة وبعد المعصية اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الله أكبر سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده الله أكبر الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده الله أكبر 
أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وتقبل شفاعته وارفع درجته بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد الله أكبر سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده الله أكبر الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأغنى وبحمده الله أكبر بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد سبحان الله والحمد لله وتعالى عبد الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله وتعالى عبد الله والله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده الله أكبر الله أكبر سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده يا لطيف ارحم عبدك الضعيف الله أكبر بسم الله وبالله الحمد لله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم إنه ليس لي علم بموضع رزقي وإنما أطلبه بخطرات تخدر على قلبي فأجول في طلبه البلدان فأنا فيما أنا طالب كالحيران لا أدري في سهل هو أم في جبال أم في أرض أم في سماء أم في بر أم في بحر وعلى يدي من ومن قبله من وقد علمت أن علمه عندك وأسبابه بيدك وأنت الذي تقسمه بلطفك 
وتسببه برحمتك اللهم فصل على محمد وآله واجعل يا رب رزقك لي واسعا ومطلبه سهلا ومأخذه قريبا ولا تعنني بطلب ما لم تقدر لي فيه رزقا فإنك غني عن عذابي وأنا فقير إلى رحمتك فصل على محمد وآله وجد على عبدك بفضلك إنك ذو فضل عظيم اللهم صل على Sisters, Assalamu uh, Alaikum. Uh, please recite Surah Fatiha for Rumin of uh, tonight's uh, sponsor with a loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Requesting one another, please come to the member. And we'll, um, while he's ascending, just a quick reminder inshallah, tomorrow, uh, uh, Salatul Jummah at 1 30. But Muhammad Wali Muhammad, Salawat. <laughs> Recite a salawat, please. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjal wa ajjal. Astaghfirullah ala Muhammad wa 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 ala وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى فرجان وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين for the love of our beloved prophet and his beloved progeny please recite a second loud salawat for the hastening and the return of our beloved 12th Imam, a third final loud salawat. <clears throat> so inshallah, tonight we'll continue with the discussion that we were having on the topic of khutbatul muttaqin, this khutbah in which Ali ibn Abi Talib, he describes to his companion Hammam the characteristics of the true believers, however you translate this word muttaqin, we're just gonna go with the true believers really. And he reached, the, he went through a couple lines at the very beginning, he talked about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth, and we kinda talked about the purpose of our creation. And then amongst the first characteristics that Ali ibn Abi Talib pointed out was this, he said these individuals, when they speak, mantiquhum as-sawab. When they speak, they speak well. When they speak, they speak properly. And we said that Ali ibn Abi Talib, he made this one point and he moved on. That was it. He doesn't explain what does it mean exactly for them that their speech is the proper speech. What does it mean exactly? What are the manners that they keep in mind? What is the etiquette that they keep in mind? The hadith or the khutbah of Ali ibn Abi Talib doesn't really explain these details. So that's where we go through other verses of the Quran and other hadith. And this is where we started our discussion last week. We said that there are a number of etiquette that we have to keep in mind when we speak to one another because the way we interact with one another 90% of the time is through the speech that we have with one another. 
And if you want to treat people well, you have to speak to people in a good way. The same way you can hug someone and show them affection, you can also hug someone and show affection through the words that you use. Yes? The same way you can hurt someone physically, you can use your words to hurt someone as well. Sometimes that might hurt even more than hurting a person, God forbid, or physically. So the interactions that we have, 90% of it, maybe more of it, is the way that we speak to one another. We started going through these different characteristics or these different etiquette that we have to keep in mind when we speak to one another. Number one, for those who remember, was that when we speak to one another, the first point is that you can't be speaking too much and too long. And I mentioned this last week, and I got some comments about it as well. And we talked about how at times spouses, for example, they don't keep this in mind. Parents, children, it can go any which way that you can Think about it. If you want to make your point, you have to make your point in a short manner, and you have to be able to move on. Long discussion, a lecture, that's for sometimes, yes? But if it's a point you've discussed before especially, it doesn't have to be a lecture every single time. And we talked about how the lines of Ali ibn Abi Talib, they're usually very short. They're very precise and to the point. That was number one. We talked about that. We moved on to number two, and this is the one that I want to take some more time speaking about tonight, inshallah. And that was this. The second flaw that you find in the, in the way that people speak to one another is when people speak to another person and the person who's on the receiving side, instead of hearing what that person is saying and listening well and acknowledging the pain and the difficulty that he's going through or the achievement that he has that he's very happy about, instead of acknowledging this and giving him credit, acknowledging it and comforting his pain, he quickly makes this discussion about himself. And this is a serious, serious problem. This person comes to him, he says, you know what, I'm going through this difficulty, you know, life has become very difficult. Financially, I'm going through difficulties. Before he can get to the end of his sentence, this person says, you know what, I'm going through a situation even worse than yours. Mine is even worse. Acknowledge his pain, acknowledge his difficulty. This person feels worthless now. Why? Because he feels like he's complaining about something that another person has bigger problems. And yes, other people do have sometimes bigger problems. No doubt about that. But yet Quran and Hadith teach us that we do what? When someone comes to us with a difficulty, they come to us with a pain, you are to acknowledge it. You are to share that pain and that burden with them. And this is why hadith after hadith says that you are to, when someone loses their loved one, what do you do? You go and you sit with them. Why? Why do you go visit their house, for example? Why do you come to the majlis that they're holding for this person? Because you want to say that I'm acknowledging your pain. And this has great thawab in Islam. The hadith of the Prophet that we narrated last week. He says, Man azza musaban, Whoever does ta'ziyah, whoever comforts the pain of someone who's lost a loved one or is going through a difficulty, he has the reward similar to the one who actually went through the pain. That's a big claim. It's not a small claim. That you didn't go through it, but because you did such a good job of comforting another person who went through that difficulty, you are rewarded in that same manner. It's a very big thing. But if I make the conversation about myself immediately, do I even have an opportunity to comfort the pain of this person? Do I have an opportunity to offer my condolences to this person, to have his pain calm down a little bit? No, because the discussion is automatically about what? It's automatically about me. Sometimes it's pain that someone comes to you with. Sometimes no, and this is where we're going to move on to our new discussion. Sometimes no, someone comes to you with an achievement. Something they're happy about. Something they've taken care of that they're really excited about. They come to you, they want to share it with you. Again, you'll find many times people, instead of acknowledging the achievement of this person, MashaAllah, that's wonderful, oh really? Instead of reacting that way, what do they do? Oh, this is nothing, I did twice of this last time. And this person is flat all of a sudden, yes? <laughs> you don't even feel like speaking of your achievements anymore. Why? Because Fulani or Fulan, I should say, you know, you know, it's a male or female, Fulan or Fulani, they did 10 times of what you're doing right now. So you have nothing to be proud of anymore. This is not what Quran and Hadith teaches us, yes? Quran and Hadith teaches us when someone comes to you with an achievement, you are to celebrate with them. 
You don't steal that moment of joy and happiness. Say why? Here's a, a little sign from Quran and Hadith that teaches us this. The reason why you and I are to celebrate the, the achievements of others and be happy for them and not steal their moment of happiness, yes, and joy from them is because when you have the smallest of achievements, when it comes to your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He acknowledges it. He values it. How many servants has God had? Seven billion, trillion, whatever number you want to come up with, right? But if you pray, he listens to you. So many other servants of Allah. No, but if you pray, as if, you know, we've heard sometimes we say, you say, as if he only has one servant. Yes? I haven't found this in hadith, but you know, it's a common saying and it's true. As if he only has one servant. You take a small step towards him. It's small, it's very significant or insignificant. It should be in his eyes. But he is celebrating this with you. He's happy for you. He acknowledges it. This is not just a claim we make. Hadith tells us this. Hadith tells us that when a servant of Allah takes a step towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is celebrating the step that he took with him with the malaika, with the angels. There's conversations that go on when you take that one step towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's conversations he has with the malaika. But the reality is you're just one servant. And the step you took, there are other servants who have taken steps ten times bigger. Isn't that the reality? But still, you stay away from one sin, he turns to his malaika. He says, this servant of mine, he stayed away from the sin for me. This is very valuable. This is what hadith says. The hadith of the Prophet says this. Now this hadith in particular is about a young individual who is staying away from sin. Other hadith, they speak about anyone who stays away from sin. The Prophet, he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى يُبَاهِ بِالشَّابِ الْعَابِدِ لِلْمَلَائِكَتِهِ He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares his pride with the malaika when it comes to a young servant of his who obeys him. So what? I stayed away from that sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is big. Is it big for him? No. He has thousands of other servants who are doing the same thing. But because it's big for you, he acknowledges it. It's big in your life. I am, I am ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, yes? I am going to acknowledge it in your life. This is big for you. And someone can sit there and say, Ya Allah, but your prophet, he did ten times the amount. He says, yes, but for this servant of mine, this, he's taking a step towards me. I'm going to acknowledge it. It's a big deal. In his life, it's a big deal. In my life, it may not be a big deal. How many times will people come and tell you something? In your life, it's not a big deal at all. You don't even care. But in their life, it's a big deal. In their life, they're very happy about it. Yes? What are you going to do? You're going to sit there and ruin their moments of joy and happiness? Or are you going to acknowledge their happiness? You're going to celebrate with them. Which one is it? Because that celebrating that you do is idkhal surur. Remember last week we talked about idkhal surur, the happiness that you bring into the heart of another believer. And this is very important in marital relationships. This is also very important. The husband might be talking about something that the wife doesn't even care about. But it's important for him. So for him, you acknowledge it, you celebrate it with him. And maybe she talks about something that may not be too important for you. You have different interests. Yes? It's not too important for you. But because it's important for her, you can celebrate with her. You can bring that joy and happiness to her. The hadith says, when the servant of Allah, even though he has billions of other servants out there, when one of his servants stays away from sin, he turns to his malaika. He says, Yaqul, unduru ila abdi. He says, Look at my servant. He's taking these steps from me. Taraka shahwatahu min ajli. He's staying away from his desires because of me. Ya Allah, this, you had prophets who used to stay up all night and worshiping you. He says, Fine, this is big for him. In his life, it's big. Therefore, in my life, it's big as well. Or in, in my world, it's big as well. Then you move on. I want to share with you another hadith that speaks of this concept. 
in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about Surah Al-Fatiha, the Surah that we recite all the time in Salat. And the hadith begins like this, this hadith from the 11th Imam. The hadith begins, it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has divided Surah Al-Fatiha between himself and his servants. Half of Surah Al-Fatiha, the beginning of it has to do with who? Has to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From Iyakan Abudu Iyakan Astain onwards, all of a sudden the discussion swi switches to who? You are asking you for help. Yes? The first initial verses is no mention of anyone else outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Maliki Yaumidin. It's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? So he says, We have divided Surah Al Fatiha between myself and my servants. Then the narration continues. Amali of Shaykh al Saduq. He narrates. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, every line of Surah Al-Fatiha that the person who is praying recites. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala respond to him? And you have to keep in mind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all these other servants with better ikhlas, better faith than this servant of his who is reciting the same surah. But he doesn't sit there and say, I have other servants, so I don't really care about this one. There are servants who do more for me, so what is this that you're bringing to my door? No, he acknowledges it. This is a big deal for you. So the hadith continues. It says, إِذَا قَالَ الْعَابْدِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ When the servant says, Bismillah, at the beginning of Surah Al-Fatiha, look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledges the effort of this individual. قَالَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ He says, بَدَأَ عَبْدِي بِسْمِ He says, did you hear? He's speaking to the malaika. He says, did you hear? He started his work and he started his life with my name. You have billions of servants. Oh, everyone. It's important for him. He's growing right now. It's important for me too. He says, Bada Abdi Bismi, number one. Because he started with my name, therefore I have to make sure that I take care of the ends of his. Affairs. I'll take care of his affairs for him. And I will bless him in the different situations that he's in in life. Then the servant continues. He says, When he moves on to the second line, you know, you and I, we just recite these, right? We don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to us. He says, When you recite the second line, قَالَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ حَمِدَنِي عَبْدِي my servant, he praised me. Did you hear that? So he turns to the malaika, he says, He's acknowledging that the blessings that he has is from me. How, how if we had a lack, for, lack of a better term, how proud he is for his servant. He says, you see, he realizes these blessings that he has, it's not his, he knows it's mine. Because it's like this, So I'm going to take all of you as my witness. All angels be my witness. I'm going to do this now. I'm going to add to the blessings that he has in this dunya, the blessings of akhirah as well. It's a big deal. In his life, it's a big deal. I'm going to make a big deal out of it as well. He continues, he says, when the servant says, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the third verse, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ushidukum, you all are my witness. This is so interesting. Every step of the way we recite these verses, we have no idea what we're saying. There's a whole conversation happening. He says, Ushidukum, kama atarafa, Ushidukum, la uwafiranna min rahmati haddahu. He called me Rahman and Rahim. This is a big deal. We have to celebrate. We have to make it a big deal for him. We will bless him with our mercy even more. He moves on. فَإِذَا قَالَ مَالِكِ يَوْمِدِّينَ He turns to the malaika again. He says, أُشْهِدُكُمْ You all be my witness. And كَمَا اَعْتَرَفَ أَنِّي أَنَا مَالِكُ يَوْمِدِّينَ The same way he said that I am the one who has power on the day of judgment. Right? He's admitting to this. He says, Maliki Yawmuddin, because of this, on the day of judgment, I'm going to make his hisab easy for him. This personalized attention. He moves on. When he says, Iyaka na'abudu, he says, Ushidukum, you all are my witnesses, that I am going to reward him because of this ibadah. Iyaka nasta'een, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm going to help him in times of difficulty. All of these, he is addressing who? 
He's addressing the angels. Then he comes to إِهْدِنَ الصَّلَاةَ mustaqim Until the end of the surah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِعَبْدِي ma sa'al." Everything that he asks of me, I'm going to give it to him. This personalized you know, attention. And here's the point. Somehow, some way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds what you and I are speaking to him and saying to him, interesting enough, in my words, of course, to listen and to pay attention and to acknowledge. And yet you and I don't find any reason to acknowledge the words of the other servants of Allah. Somehow what we say is interesting enough for him. He listens. But somehow we're so important that when another servant of God speaks, uh, we don't have time for this. They had come to us with happiness and joy. It's not a big deal. Other people have done bigger things. This was never the seerah of the Ahlul Bayt and the Prophet. So when people come to us, we are to not make the discussion about ourselves. That's number two. That's the second flaw. Moving on to number three. Number three is one of the worst you will ever come across. Number three is the one who is too blunt and too truthful. Everything that's true, he's going to say it. If something crosses his mind and it's true, he's going to say it. If it's not true, of course, it's a lie. Yeah, so We're not even talking about that. Everything that comes to his mind and he acknowledges this is true, so he's going to open his mouth and he's going to say it. It's a big problem. It's a big problem. And sometimes people will defend this behavior as well. They'll say, you know what, Sheikh? You know, I've had people tell me this. No, Sheikh, I have no filter. Like this is a, it's a compliment or it's like, you know, some awesome characteristic, yeah? I have, Sheikh, I keep it true with people, you know? So I keep it, you know, say for the younger guys, I keep it 100, you know, I just, I just tell them how it is. Where in Quran or Hadith did Islam tell us to just say it how it is all the time? Where? No, this is not how the Prophet was. You go, you eat the food, the food is not delicious. I, it's true, it's not good. You're not just supposed to say anything that comes to your mind. Anything that's true, just because it's true. You know, we have this saying in Farsi. We say, Juzrast nashayat guf. Right? Like, nabayat guf, rather. It says, if it's not true, you shouldn't be saying it. And then he says, Harrast nashayat guf. But every true statement, you also shouldn't be saying and uttering either. Just because it's true. No, you have to be very careful when to open your mouth and when to close your mouth. This is one of the keys to success in your personal life, in my personal life, and in our professional lives. Everywhere you go, if you know when to speak and when to keep quiet, this will benefit you immensely. Sometimes something good is going to happen for this person. He opens his mouth at the wrong time. Doesn't know now is not the time to open his mouth. He can't wait till the right time. And nobody demonstrated this for us better than the story of the Muslimin when they were forced to migrate to Habasha, to Ethiopia. During the beginning of the, of the mission of the Prophet, this is the first, fifth year after the Prophethood. The Muslimin, they are under severe difficulty. They are under severe surveillance. Many of them are being tortured. The Prophet told them, you, you can go. You can go to this land of Ethiopia. There is a king there. You know, we refer to the king by the name of Najashi, but Najashi is actually the term they use for all of the kings of that area. You know how we say like Caesar is the name of all of the kings of, or, or all of the, yes, of, of Rome, for example. Najashi is similar for, this very similar thing for that area of the world. He said, you can go there. This king, he has a characteristic he doesn't do injustice to anybody. You can go there. You can live you know, in peace under his rule. These Muslimin came. And when you look into history, the way they were able to get away from Quraysh in these moments actually is more like a movie than just you know, a story in history. Because the narration says they came and they got on ships that were heading that way. Otherwise, it would have been difficult for them to get away. There was a ship that came at the same time where these guys got to the shore. 70, 80 of them, different, you know, historians have mentioned different numbers. They get on this ship and they head towards Habasha. And later on, there are others who also join them as well. Okay, they come to Habasha. In Habasha, it's a very critical moment. 
Because what happened when Quraysh heard about this? They went back, they started to plan and plot. They said, we can't do this. We have to make sure we send representatives and we will be able to convince Najashi to send these guys back. I mean, these guys are nobodies. These are, these are you know, these are, we'll tell them there's a people, some of the young people amongst us, they've lost their mind. They're turning away from their own people. This is what we'll tell them. That's what they did. So they sent representatives. Amongst those representatives, Amr ibn As. Should ring a bell for you. Yes? The right hand man of Muawiyah later on. This was before he had even entered into Islam. He goes with another representative. They go to Najashi. When they get to Najashi, they had sent him gifts. Some narrations say they had sent the other, you know, his commander's gifts as well. Everyone in the army gets gifts as well. So they really needed these Muslims to come back. Okay, critical moment. Very, very crucial moment. And they came to Najashi. They said, Najashi, we're friends with you. And you know us, and we know you. There is a group of our people, they have come here, they don't deserve to be here. They have fled from us. They have to come back. And Najashi said, well, I have to listen, I have to hear what they have to say. I can't just send them back. So they bring them to court. And the narration says that these muhajireen, they were speaking amongst themselves. Like, what are we going to do now? What are we going to say in this moment? So they bring them back. And he asked Ja'far, the head of the Muslims, yes, this is the brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he asked him, he said, why is it that you guys fled away? He said, listen, we were a people, we used to do horrible things. This prophet came, he taught us to stay away from these things, you know, stay away from zina and stay away from drinking and stay away from stealing and murdering one another. And because of this, these guys started to persecute us. We were forced to leave. And we've come to this land in the hope that we can live in peace. And Najashi was listening to this. He said, this is, sounds like a very good religion. But here's the crucial moment though. He said, from these revelations that your prophet has had, do you remember anything you can recite for me? And tell me a little bit about it. You have to remember now, this is not, the whole Quran has not been revealed. You might say a fourth, maybe less than that of the Quran has been revealed at this time. But amongst those surahs that have been revealed is Surah Maryam. And what did Ja'far say? This is the wisdom that we're talking about. Knowing what to say in what moments. And knowing when to hold back even when what you are saying is true. Knowing when to hold back. Did Ja'far sit there and say, listen Najashi, you know how you believe in Jesus as your, your Lord and Savior and your, you know, he's human and God at the same We don't believe in any of this. Is that what Ja'far did? No. Ja'far, according to one narration, he started to recite those verses of the Qur'an that depict those moments where Maryam was going through the pain of her pregnancy. The call came from the skies, Maryam, push this palm tree that you have and the dates will fall upon you and there will be a spring that will start to flow beneath your feet. And he started to describe these moments and go on and on until Najashi, at the end of it, he stopped. And according to one narration, he started to cry. And then here's the one line I want you to pay attention to. He turned to Ja'far and he said this. He said, Ja'far, what you believe in and what we believe in, it comes from the same source. What does that mean? Does that mean we believe in the same thing? No, that's the whole point. This was the beauty of what Ja'far was able to do in that moment. Because everybody knows that we don't believe what these guys believe. This is the wisdom. If you have wisdom, you know what to say in the right moment, when to speak, when to be quiet, how to say things, what things that are true to say, what things that might be true, maybe you don't say in certain moments, you can pull off something like this. He never said, Ja'far, we believe in the same thing. No, they believe in some things that are actually very different from one another. He just said, Ja'far, you know, what you said and what we believe in, it comes from the same source. And this is the beauty of what Ja'far was able to do in those moments. Because, you know, Surah Al-Tawheed was already revealed. Lam yalid wa lam yulat. We don't believe in this. But is that what Ja'far said? No. Ja'far pinpointed the right area. 
Yes? And then in Surah Maryam, if you come after these verses that speak about Lady Maryam, five, ten verses later, it says, مَا كَانَ لِلَّهِ أَنْ يَتَّخِذَ مَنْ وَلَدٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never take a son. But did Jafar, re- re- you know, recite this verse? No. Because he's wise. Is it true that God doesn't have a son? Yes. He'd be the first to tell you. But in that moment, he says, this is not what I want to recite for him. Just because it's true, I have to say it. No, this is recipe for disaster. As the Prophet has said, one is to store his tongue away and set it aside the same way he sets his gold and silver aside. When you put your gold and silver aside, what do you do? It's in the corner. Every now and then, you go and grab a little bit of it. He says, your speech has to be like that as well. You have to be very careful. With that, inshallah, we'll bring tonight's talk to an end. If we can dim the lights, inshallah, we'll take a moment to remember our beloved Imam al-Baqir, that we are commemorating his shahada during these days and nights. Sallallahu alayka ya Muhammad ibn Ali. The city of Medina that was once a city of the Prophet, that was once a city of happiness and joy, has now turned into a city of sadness. It's now turned into a city of grief and pain for the Ahlul Bayt. This lonely and gharib imam of ours, whose grave, if you saw, you would have assumed this is just a normal person who's buried here. Even up to this day, our beloved imam, his grave, no sign, no shrine, no respect, no honor given to him. This imam of ours who witnessed the calamities in the plains of Karbala, difficulties while he was alive, difficulties even as you come to these days and nights, that are the final days and nights of the life of Imam al-Baqir. And the narration says that Hisham ibn Abd al-Malik, he fed poison to Imam al-Baqir. And this poison, it started to affect the body of Imam al-Baqir. Imagine this body gets weaker and weaker and the pain of the Imam increases day by day. In those final moments, Imam al-Sadiq now narrates for us when he was speaking to a companion of his he says I remember those final days my father had gotten sick and this was not the first time that my father was sick before he had gotten sick as well and we were worried about him as well but those times he used to tell us that that sickness was not going to be his last sickness this time I turned to my father and my father said no the same angels who told me that I would make it out alive of those sicknesses have told me this time is my final time. Imagine the atmosphere in the house of Imam al-Baqir. Imam al-Sadiq says on that last day, my father turned to me. He said, Ya Jafar, go and get some of our companions. Bring some of our friends because I want to do my final wasiyat in these moments. He says, I brought some of the friends inside. They started, he started to mention his wasiyats to me one after another. My son, bury me in this way. Have this clothing as my kafan. Put my ammama for me as well. When he was done with these wasiyats, then the companions left. I turned to him. I said, Father, you didn't need to mention these all in front of others. He said, no, I wanted them to know that I am doing my wasiyah to you. Because after I'm gone, there will be those who will deny that you are the next imam. There will be those who will want to turn away from you. I want them to see that I am doing wasiyah to you. Then Imam al-Sadiq says, I asked asked my father, Imam al-Baqir, I said, but today, out of all of these days, today, your health seems to be better than all of the other days. Are you sure that you will be leaving this world today? And he says, Imam al-Baqir said this one line. Look at this one line that his father told him. He said, Ya Ja'far, Did you not hear the call of my father, Imam al-Sajjad, coming towards me today? Didn't you hear the call of Imam al-Sajjad? He said, come to me faster. Come to me quicker. Ta'ali, ajjal. Hurry up and come to me faster. You heard the call of my father. Today is that final day until Imam al-Baghir takes those final breaths. Imagine the moments where Imam al-Sadiq is sitting by the body of his beloved father. And this reminds you of the relationship between another father and another son, both of which were there in the plains of Karbala as well. And that is none but Imam al-Hussein and Ali al-Akbar, the Masaib of Ali al-Akbar. 
is so difficult to recite. This father and son had a bond, they had a relationship like none other. Imagine on the 10th of Muharram, when all of these companions have gone towards the battlefield, they say now it was time for Bani Hashim to walk towards the battlefield. Then they say the first person who came to the tent of Abu Abdullah was none but Ali al-Akbar. Imagine the footsteps of Ali al-Akbar when he slowly makes his way towards the tent of Abu Abdullah. What went through the heart of Hussein when he laid eyes upon Ali al-Akbar? If you're a parent, you know the pain of this moment. When you look at your child and you know your child is not going to make it through today. You know your child will not be alive tomorrow. They say Hussein spoke with Ali al-Akbar. We don't know what he said. All we know is that the hadith says, the narration says, quickly he gave him permission. Because these moments were difficult for Hussein. He couldn't even bear Ali al-Akbar standing in front of him, asking him for permission. What are you doing with the heart of Hussein? Hussein can't bear the pain of watching Ali al-Akbar go. He told him, Ali, if you want to go, go quickly. But you have to go to the tent of the women and the children. You have to say your goodbyes and your farewell to them because they're going to miss you. They had all of their hope in you, oh Ali. Go to their tent and then go to the battlefield. The narration says Ali and Al-Akbar then heads out of the tent of Hussein. He goes into the tent of the women. And some of the narrations say that these women and children, they gathered around Ali and Al-Akbar. And one of the lines that they said was this, one of these children, one of these women said, Ya Ali, irham ghurbatana. Have mercy on us. You're leaving us here in the middle of nowhere. There's no one to defend us here. There's no one to protect us here. And the narration says that some of them said, you know what, take us back to Medina. That's where we used to be safe. Ya Ali, you're going to go. You're going to leave us here with nobody. And the hadith says, وَتَعَلَّقْنَا بِأَطْرَافِهِ They started to pull on the clothes of Ali and Al-Akbar. And Ali says, I can't bear this pain, but I have to go towards the battlefield. And he starts to move away towards the battlefield. And this is where Hussein started to break down. This is where this father started to break down. The hadith says that he started to look at Ali and Al-Akbar walking away. He looked at him with all of this despair. He had looked at him with no hope left in his eyes. Because he knows Ali is not going to come back from this after today. He knows Ali is not going to be alive after today. Ali walks towards the battlefield and Hussein has nothing to do but just to share his pain with Allah and to share his pain with those who are in the battlefield. The narration says that his eyes filled up with tears. And he started to cry as he saw Ali and Al-Akbar go towards the battlefield. And he raised his hand. He said, Allahumma shahad, Ya Allah, you bear witness. You see what they're doing now. The one I'm sending towards them now, exactly like the Prophet, and now they won't even have mercy on him. Ali goes towards the battlefield. He attacks on the left. He attacks on the right. He comes back and he uttered this one line to Hussein that broke the heart of Hussein. What does a father have to respond when his son asks him for water? He said, Father, is there any water left in these tents? Ya Ali, you know there's no water left in these tents. And Ali just wants to see Hussein one more time. Hussein said, Go back soon, your grandfather. He will quench your thirst in the battlefield of Karbala. Imagine Ali rides on his horse. He goes back and this time he is struck on the head and he falls from the horse and he calls out. He says, Father, come to me. Imagine the way Hussein ran into this battlefield. How do we even understand the pain that Hussein went through on the 10th of Muharram? He ran in this, in this battlefield. That narration says he put his face on the face of Ali. And he said, Ya Ali, ala dunya ba'dakal afa. I don't want this world after you. This world is worth nothing to me after you. And then slowly he turned to his companions. He said, Come and take Ali all the way back to the tents with you. This body of Ali, there's nothing left of it. I can't even take his body back by myself. Come and take the body of Ali all the way back to the tents. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us the tawfiq to be amongst the true followers of the Ahlul Bayt, insha'Allah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that all of our brothers and sisters who are going through pain and difficulty, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes their pain and difficulty, insha'Allah. 
We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, last but not least, that he hastens the return of our beloved 12th Imam. Let's take a moment to recite Surah Al-Fatiha for all of our marhumin and marhumat, and especially the marhumin and marhumat of the sponsors of tonight's program, Sister Zainab Sayyid and family, in loving memory of Mir Himayat Ali and Sayyid Shabir Ali, and an anonymous brother or sister with a loud salawat. Inshallah, we'll begin with the recitation of uh, Dua al Kumail. If we can pass out the booklets, or inshallah, you can use your phone to follow along. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم إني أسألك برحمتك التي وسعات كل شيء وبقوتك التي قهرت بها كل شيء وخدع لها كل شيء وذل لها كل شيء وبجبروتك التي غلبت بها كل شيء وبعزتك التي لا يقوم لها شيء وبعظمتك التي ملأت كل شيء وبسلطانك الذي على كل شيء وبوجهك الباقي بعد فناء كل شيء وبأسمائك التي ملأت أركان كل شيء وبعلمك الذي أحاط بكل شيء وبنور وجهك الذي أضاء له كل شيء everyone يا نور يا قدوس يا نور يا نور يا قدوس يا أول الأولين ويا آخر الآخرين اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تهتك العصام اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تنزل النقام اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تغير النعام اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تحبس الدعاء اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تقطع الرجاء اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تنزل البلاء اللهم اغفر لي كل ذنب أذنبته وكل خطيئة أخطأتها اللهم إني أتقرب إليك بذكرك وأستشفع بك إلى نفسك وأسألك بجودك أن تدنيني من قربك 
وأن توزعني شكرك وأن تلهمني ذكرك اللهم إني أسألك سؤال خاضع متذلل خاشع أن تسامحني وترحمني وتجعلني بقسمك راضيا قانعا وفي جميع الأحوال متواضعا اللهم وأسألك سؤال من اشتدت فاقته وأنزل بك عند الشدائد حاجة وعدم فيما عندك رغبته اللهم عظم سلطانك وعلى مكانك وخفي مكرك وظهر أمرك وغلب قهرك وجرت قدرتك ولا يمكن الفرار من حكومتك اللهم لا أجد لذنوبي غافرا ولا لقبائحه ساترا ولا لشيء من عملي القبيح بالحسن مبدلا غيرك لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك وبحمدك ظلمت نفسي ظلمت ظلمت نفسي وتجرأت بجهلي وسكنت إلى قديم ذكرك لي ومنك علي اللهم مولاي كم من قبيح سترته وكم من فادح من البلاء أقلته وكم من عثار وقيته وكم من مكروه دفعته وكم من ثناء جميل لست أهلا له نشرته اللهم عظم بلائي وأفرط بي سوء حالي وقصرت بي أعمالي وقعدت به أغلالي وحبسني عن نفعي بعد آمالي وخدعتني الدنيا بغرورها ونفسه بجنايتها ومطالي يا سيدي فأسألك بعزتك أن لا يحجب عنك دعائي سوء عملي وفعاله ولا تفضحني بخفي ما طلعت عليه من سري ولا تعاجلني بالعقوبته على ما عملته في خلواتي من سوء فعلي وإساءته ودوام تفريطي وجهالته وكثرته شهواته وغفلتي وكن اللهم بعزتك لي في كل الأحوال رؤوفا وعلي في جميع الأمور عطوفا إلهي وربي من لي غيرك أسأله كشف ضره والنظر فيه أمري إلهي ومولاي أجريت علي حكما اتبعت فيه هوى نفسه 
ولم أحترس فيه من تزيين عدوي فغرني بما أهوى وأسعده على ذلك القضاء فتجاوزت بما جرى علي من ذلك بعد حدودك وخالفت بعد أوامرك فلك الحجة علي في جميع ذلك ولا حجة لي فيما جرى علي فيه قضاؤك وألزمني حكمك وبلاؤك وقد أتيتك يا إلهي بعد تقصيري وإسرافي على نفسي معتذرا نادما منكسرا مستقيلا مستغفرا منيبا مقرا مذعنا معترفا لا أجد مفرا مما كان مني ولا مفزعا أتوجه إليه في أمري غير قبولك عذري وإدخالك إياي في سعة من رحمتك اللهم فاقبل عذري وارحم شدة ضري وفكني من شده وثاقي يا رب ارحم ضعف بدني يا رب ارحم يا رب ارحم ضعف بدني ورقة جلدي ودقة عظمي يا من بدأ خلقي وذكره وتربيتي وبره وتغذيتي هبني لابتداء كرمك وسالفه برك بي يا إلهي وسيدي وربي أتراك معذبي بنارك بعد توحيدك وبعد من طوى عليه قلبي من معرفتك ولهج به لساني من ذكرك واعتقده ضميره من حبك وبعد صدق اعترافه ودعائه خاضعا لربوبيتك هيهات أنت أكرم من أن تضيع من ربيت أو تبعد من أدنيت أو تشرد من آويت أو تسلم إلى البلاء من كفيته ورحمت وليت شعري يا سيدي وإلهي ومولاي أتسلط النار على وجوه خرت لعذمتك ساجدا وعلى ألسنه نتقت بتوحيدك صادقا وبشكرك مادحا وعلى قلوب اعترفت بإلهيتك محققة وعلى طمائر حوت من العلم بك حتى صارت خاشعة وعلى جوارح سعات إلى أوطان تعبدك طائعة وأشارت باستغفارك مذعنا ما هكذا الظن بك ولا أخبرنا بفضلك عنك يا كريم يا رب يا كريم يا كريم يا رب 
وأنت تعلم ضعفي عن قليل من بلاء الدنيا وعقوباتها وما يجري فيها من المكاره على أهلها على أن ذلك بلاء ومكروه قليل مكثوه يسير بقاؤه قصير مدته فكيف احتمالي لبلاء الآخرة وجليل وقوع المكاره فيها وهو بلاء تطوله مدته ويدومه مقامه ولا يخفف عن أهله لأنه لا يكون إلا عن قذبك وانتقامك وسخطك وهذا ما لا تقوم له السماوات والأرض يا سيده فكيف به وأنا عبدك الذعيف الذليل الحقير المسكين المستكين يا إلهي وربي وسيدي ومولاي لأي الأمور إليك أشكو ولما منها أضج وأبكه لأليم العذاب وشدته أم لطول البلاء ومدته فلئن صيرتني للعقوبات مع أعدائك وجمعت بيني وبين أهل بلائك وفرقت بيني وبين أحبائك وأوليائك فهبني يا إلهي وسيده ومولاي وربي صبرت على عذابك فكيف أصبر على فراقك وهبني صبرت على حر نارك فكيف أصبر عن النظر إلى كرامتك أم كيف أسكن في النهار ورجائي عفوك فبعزتك يا سيدي ومولاي أقسم صادقا لئن تركتني ناطقا لأضجن إليك بين أهلها ضجيج الآملين ولأصرخن إليك صراخ المستصرخين ولأبكين عليك بكاء الفاقدين ولأنادينك أين كنت يا ولي المؤمنين يا غاية آمال العارفين يا غياث المستغيثين يا غياث يا غياث يا حبيب قلوب الصادقين ويا إله العالمين أفتراك سبحانك يا إلهي وبحمدك تسمع فيها صوت عبد مسلم سجن فيها بمخالفته وضاق طعم عذابها بمعصيته وحبس بين أتباقها بجرمه وجريرته وهو يضج إليك ضجيج مؤمل لرحمتك ويناديك بنسان أهل توحيدك ويتوسل إليك بربوبيتك يا مولاي فكيف يبقى في العذاب وهو يرجو ما سلف من حلمك أم كيف تؤلمه النار وهو يأمل فضلك ورحمتك
أم كيف يحرقه لهيبها وأنت تسمع صوته وترى مكانا أم كيف يشتمل عليه زفيرها وأنت تعلم ضعفا أم كيف يتقلقل بين أتباقها وأنت تعلم صدقا أم كيف تزجره زبانيتها وهو يناديك يا رب أم كيف يرجو فضلك في عتقه منها فتتركه فيها هيهات ما ذلك الظن بك ولا المعروف من فضلك ولا مشبه لما عاملت به الموحدين من برك وإحسانك فباليقين أقطع لولا ما حكمت به من تعذيب جاحديك وقضيت به من إخلاد معانديك لجعلت النار كلها بردا وسلاما وما كان لأحد فيها مقرا ولا مقاما لكنك تقدست أسماءك أقسمت أن تملأها من الكافرين من الجنة والناس أجمعين وأن تخلد فيها المعاندين وأن تجل ثناؤك قلت مبتدئا وتطولت بالإنعام متكرما أفمن كان مؤمنا كمن كان فاسقا لا يستوون إلهي وسيدي فأسألك بالقدرة التي قدرتها وبالقضية التي حتمتها وحكمتها وغلبت من عليه أجريتها أن تهب لي في هذه الليلة وفي هذه الساعة كل جرم أجرمته وكل ذنب أذنبته وكل قبيح أسررته وكل جهل عملته كتمته أو أعلنته أخفيته أو أظهرته وكل سيئة أمرت بإثباتها الكرام الكاتبين الذين وكلتهم بحفظ ما يكون مني وجعلتهم شهودا علي مع جوارحي وكنت أنت الرقيب علي من ورائهم والشاهد لما خفي عنهم وبرحمتك أخفيت وبفضل كها سترت وأن توفر حذي من كل خير تنزل أو إحسان تفضل أو بر تنشر أو رزق تبسط أو ذنب تغفر أو خطأ تستر يا ربي يا ربي يا رب يا ربي يا ربي يا ربي يا رب يا إلهي والسيد ومولاي ومالك رقي يا من بيده ناصيته يا عليما بضره ومسكنته يا خبيرا بفقره وفاقتي يا ربي يا رب يا ربي 
يا ربي يا ربي يا رب أسألك بحقك وقدسك وأعظم صفاتك وأسمائك أن تجعل أوقاتي من الليل والنهار بذكرك معمورا وبخدمتك موصولا وأعمالي عندك مقبولا حتى تكون أعمالي وأورادي كلها وردا واحدا وحالي في خدمتك سرمدا يا سيدي يا من عليه معولي يا من إليه شكوت أحوالي يا ربي يا ربي يا ربي يا ربي يا ربي قو على خدمتك جوارحي واشتد على العزيمة جوانحي وهب لي الجد في خشيتك والدوام في الاتصال بخدمتك حتى أسرح إليك في ميادين السابقين وأسرع إليك في المبادرين وأشتاق إلى قربك في المشتاقين وأدنو منك دنو المخلصين وأخافك مخافة الموقنين وأجتمع في جوارك مع المؤمنين اللهم ومن أرادني بسوء فأرد ومن كادني فكد وجعلني من أحسن عبيدك نصيبا عندك وأقربهم منزلة منك وأخصهم زلفة لديك فإنه لا ينال ذلك إلا بفضلك وجدله بجودك وعطف علي بمجدك واحفظني برحمتك وجعل لساني بذكرك لهجا وقلبي بحبك متيما ومن علي بحسن إجابتك وأقلني عثرتي واغفر زلتي فإنك قضيت على عبادك بعبادتك وأمرتهم بدعائك وضمنت لهم الإجابة فإليك يا ربي نصبت وجهي وإليك يا ربي مددت يدي فبعزتك استجب لي دعائي وبلغني مناي ولا تقطع من فضلك رجائي واكفني شر الجن والإنس من أعدائي يا سريع الرضا يا سريع يا سريع الرضا اغفر لمن لا يملك إلا الدعاء فإنك فعاله لما تشاء يا من اسمه دواء وذكره شفاء وطاعته غنى ارحم من رأس ماله الرجاء وسلاحه البكاء يا سابغ النعام يا دافع النقام يا نور المستوحشين في الظلام 
يا عالمان لا يعلم صل على محمد وآل محمد وفعل بما أنت أهله وصلى الله على رسوله والأئمة الميامين من آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا حبيب الله السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب السلام عليك يا فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا حسن المجتبى السلام عليك يا عبا عبد الله ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا صاحب العصر والزمان السلام عليك يا خليفة الرحمن السلام عليك يا إمام الإنس والجان ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم يا أهل بيت النبوة جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل